All right, kids, so good to see you in here. Uh, I love having you with us. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing that we've been doing. Will you stand up for just a few minutes, okay? Kids, go ahead and stand up, and I want you to look at me, because I have something to share with you before we jump in. Today, kids, we are going to be talking about the volume of things. You know what volume means? Like how loud something is or how quiet something is? We're going to be talking about the volume of things, and my hope is to give you some sound advice. Yeah, it's the best dad joke I got all week. Come on. All right, so here's the thing. Kids, I want you to shout out when I ask you the question. I want you to think about it for just a moment and then shout out your answer, okay? What is the best time to be really loud? When is the best time to be really loud? When should you be really, really loud? Outside. Outside? When? When? Outside, okay, we'll go with outside. Okay, so when is a good time to be really quiet? Inside. Inside? <laughs> okay. Hey, that is some sound advice. I like this. I like where you're going with that. Good job, parents, on teaching them that. Um, so kids, here's the thing. Today, we're continuing in this letter called Titus. So I want to read something. Listen to this, okay? This is in God's word. He says this, For there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It is necessary to silence them. So like you said, there there are times when it's good to be loud and there are times when it's good to be quiet. And Paul is telling Titus that there are some people who need to learn how to be quiet. And so that's what we're going to learn because here's the bottom line. To protect the church, to protect the church, we need to silence the lies and amplify the truth. Okay, we're going to silence the lies and amplify the truth. Thank you, kids. You can take your seats. Thank you very much uh, for your participation. Enjoy those activities. And as you're doing that, uh, just a quick confession as a parent. Um, one, of the, one of the most terrifying things that happens on a pretty regular basis in our house is we get the kids to sleep, and then um, they think that we just have like massive parties when they go to bed, which is... I'm, I wish, but um, often we will try to watch something or, or just hang out together for a little while, and we haven't figured out why, but something happens with our TV to where sometimes we're watching it, and it's like super quiet, and I'm literally deaf in my left ear, so I'm always like, just make it louder, make it louder, so it'll be just really, really quiet, and we'll turn it way up, and then like a few minutes into it, all of a sudden something changes with the TV or whatever, it, I don't know what it is, but all of a sudden it goes like, crazy loud, like everything in it, not just like a moment in the movie or, or video or whatever it is, it's just like everything is amplified like crazy, and so it's terrifying to us, and we're just like, what does that got to be like for our kids? We're like, what if that wakes them up, and, and like they wake up to a dinosaur roaring or something, like that's kind of terrifying for them, so we don't want that to happen, um, but it just makes me think about this reality that we need to wrestle with today, is that there are some things that should not be heard. Some things should not be heard. I don't want my kids to wake up to somebody screaming in a movie because that'd be scary. <laughs> but some things should not be heard, and, and that extends beyond just what you wake up to. Uh, so we are continuing in Titus, and to, to get you up to date in this series that we're calling Entrusted, looking at this letter, Paul wrote to Titus. He called him a son in the faith. He left him on the island of Crete, and he's supposed to be going around to different towns and establishing elders, giving structure to the church. And so he says, here are qualifications for the elders. And we concluded those qualifications for the elders saying, like, they need to hold on to the gospel. What they teach must be the gospel. And everything about their lives, when they're shaken up, it should be the gospel that comes out. And so the teaching matters so much, Titus. Make sure that they're holding on to the true teaching, which is the gospel. The faithful to this message that they've been handed down. And so that's where we left off last week. Now we're picking up in chapter 1, verse 10. I was told not to use this mask, and I completely forgot to change it out. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Uh, Verse 10, for there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. And so he starts with that transition word, for. And so this is tied to what we just concluded with last week. And I said, the gospel, the teaching matters. The elders, you should lead through your teaching. And so the teaching matters. It's super important to us. And why is that so important? For there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. 
It's necessary to silence them. Like, cut the volume off for them. Don't let them have a word. They are ruining entire households. And, and you got to think in context here, a household would be essentially like a church. Like, you have these house churches. And so they're ruining entire churches, entire households, by teaching what they shouldn't. It's false teaching. And why are they doing it? In order to get money dishonestly. And so I want you to, to catch some stuff in here. He says, especially those from the circumcision party. That gives us a clue as to who he's talking about here. And these are people who have a Judaic background, the Hebrew people. And so circumcision was this outward sign that was supposed to represent this reality of they belong to the people of God. And so it was a physical sign. It was an action, a work that they would engage in. It was a way for them to say, this is who I am. And so these Judaizers, as Paul calls them in another letter, um, these people of the circumcision party, they think this is really important. If you want to be a Christian, you need to do these outward signs. You need to do these works in order to actually be part of it. You should be circumcised or you should be doing these things. It's about things that you do outwardly. And so they're, ad- they're pushing for this adherence to the law. They're saying you need to follow the law, which is about these works and things that you can do And so that's what they're pushing. And Paul says, no, they're rebellious. They're full of empty talk and deception. You need to silence them. They're ruining entire households. Don't allow this. And why are they doing it? To get money dishonestly. And I want you to see an irony here. There's an irony that this this group of people, they're coming in, and what they're saying is, your works, your outward appearance, your behavior, it matters. It matters so much, so be righteous. And so on the outside, they look really good. They look really righteous on the outside. And yet what he's saying here is that inwardly they're evil. They're full of deception. And even their motive, it's it's about dishonest gain. So it's dishonest teaching, it's dishonest gain. They're just trying to make money off of you. And so the people who are known for being outwardly good are actually inwardly terrible. And so Paul continues on, and on verse 12, he says, one of their very own prophets, who is there? It's referring to Crete, the people who live on Crete. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. How's that for a statement for Paul to quote? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then Paul says, this testimony is true. (laughs) Paul's like, yeah, yeah, he's right. (laughs) And we actually know um, who said that. Um, This this philosopher known Epimenides, um, he was a well-known 6th century BC philosopher in Crete. And so uh, we know who that statement is attributed to. He actually made that statement. And so Paul is saying, yeah, this is how one of their very own people, one of the Cretans, he said this of themselves. He's like, listen, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul's like, it's true. You know it. And we may think here, like, hmm, Floridians are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. When you look around your life and you look at people, let's just be honest for a moment. Isn't it easy to feel like that's, that, yeah, okay. It's a pretty good assessment. It's a bunch of liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons all around here. And it's hard, but like so much of what we, what we would say if we we're honest of how we feel about so many people, like, yeah, that's true. That, that's a lot of what's around here. And liars, how hard is it to know the truth, let alone say the truth in these days? What is actually true? Just, everyone's a liar. Like, oh, what do we trust? I don't know. Uh, they're lazy. <laughs> they're evil. And lazy, and this is kind of tangent, but um, with COVID-19 and, and all of the insanity of what this has brought, one of, one of my greatest hopes in this is that the church, not just beloved church, but God's church, his people, would be refined, that we would use this as an opportunity to refocus and say, what actually matters? What does God actually want of his people? What should we really be about and so we have this beautiful opportunity to where like so much of what normal ministry looks like has been brought to a standstill. And now we can look at things and say, what's actually about advancing the kingdom? And so I have this hope, but simultaneously I have this fear. 
And, and I'm not bashing our church at all. I love hearing story after story of how our church is stepping into what it is to love each other and love God. But collectively, as the American church, um, because that's all I really have much exposure to, I have this fear when I, when I read Lazy Gluttons, that is, we have cut out so much ministry from our lives. And now I constantly hear things of like, oh, well, like, can we sustain that? Or like, should church go back to this? And I'm all for changing so many things about church that were really counterproductive and not accomplishing what the gospel wants to bring fruit into our lives. But I'm so scared when I constantly hear people about like, oh, like, we're going to burn out. We're going to, like, we're overwhelmed. It's like, why isn't this okay? And everything. Like, have we lost sight of what matters in life. And, and, and I want to tell you, like, I'm coming from a place of humility because I know I'm a pastor and I work for the church. And so I know that this can sound like, oh, easy for you to say, Kevin, um, but hear me because I love you in this. When we look at our life and the things that are exhausting us and the things that we can cut out, why would the work that matters for eternity be the thing that would so quickly be the thing to cut out? Why would we compromise the things that our king has called us to above everything else? Why would that be the thing that we cut out first? Of all the things that we could say, oh, well, too much, we got to take, just in any way, and I'm not just saying like in time, or like in every way, let's not be lazy. Let's be people who are passionate about our God and king, pressing on for what matters. And so let's, let's take opportunity, uh, let's make the most of this. Okay. So here we go. Verse 13b, so Paul has said, hey, this, this testimony is true. And now he continues and he says, for this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. What is he saying there? He just made some harsh comments. Like, I agree with this ancient philosopher. Like, you guys are all liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. But here's the thing. Call it out, Titus. Call it out. But why? For this reason. For this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith, so they may be healthy in their spirituality is what he's saying, so they may know what is actually true and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. He's equating their call to say, no, works matter. You need to do these things, be circumcised, all these outward displays. He's saying, that's like a Jewish myth. It's not possible. It's made up. You, you totally missed the point of the law. So don't let them fall into that. Don't let them pay attention to it. These people who actually reject the truth. And so what we see from that is that discipline, those hard conversations that we have as a church, the aim of discipline is actually always to restore and to strengthen. It's not to just throw out that bombshell of like, hey, like the ancient philosopher said, you guys are all liars. You're, you're crazy, evil beast, lazy gluttons, and drop it. No. The point of discipline, the point of correction, is actually to strengthen. It's to encourage us to bring about life. And so in church, when we rebuke each other, it is in grace and love. It's always to bring people back up. It's for restoration. Even church discipline and the, the stages that Jesus lays out in Matthew's gospel, it's you're cutting off ultimately so that that person would come back and realize like when a hand gets cut off from the body, it's going to shrivel up and die and it's a lot of pain. It needs to be attached back to the body. And so even in cutting something off, the hope is that they would realize and come back into the fold to come back and be part of what is necessary and life-giving. Um, but here's the thing. And, and like, if, if you hear nothing else today, like, get this. The entirety of this letter of all that we want you to see in this series entrusted comes down to this. What did he say they're like? Evil beasts. These lazy gluttons. They're all liars. That's who he's talking about. Like, who is? All Cretans. Epimenides said it. All Cretans are like this. And who is Paul telling Titus to disciple? The Cretans. And who is Paul telling Titus to turn into men who are capable of leading the church in these high qualifications? The Cretans. 
The ones who are called liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons. Everyone that you would look around and say, oh man, that's the worst of the worst. Like, no, they're not on my radar. Paul is saying, these are the ones. These are the ones that you actually, you engage them, you disciple them, you bring them up to leadership in the church. Can we see that? Can you see that in your life? That God has sovereignly brought you. You are intentionally here. You are in every relationship in your life on purpose. And so if we could shift the way we see things to not be like, oh man, these people are just ridiculous. It's like God actually has you here to invest in them, in these people. And it's so easy as a church, like whatever ministry you're in, you're like, man, I'm just praying that God would bring people in. Like, God, would you send people who can invest in this realm and, and this and this? And God is saying, no, 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 I brought people. Like, this, this is where I have you. So take the people that I've placed in your life, in your class, in your sports team, in your job place, in your family, take them and disciple them and make them beautiful followers of Jesus. Take them from being these liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons and make them qualified people who can actually lead the church. Uh, we, we want discipleship to be easy. And we can't lose sight of where we were. And so we have to identify, like, what are the motives in our heart when we're seeing these people? Like, if we, if we say, like, oh, yeah, liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And it's like, if we're honest, we, we see them. We see people that we would say, like, categorically, you're in that bucket. But here's the thing. Here, there, here's the heart check. When you see people who, who you see in sin, they're not living in the way in which you think Jesus has called them to. When you see that in someone's life, and it, and it creates this frustration in you, when you feel like you can't change it, let's, let's actually look at the frustration behind that. Why is it frustrating you so much when someone is not changing like you think they should? What's actually driving that? Is it that our frustration in seeing other sin is just making us more and more self-righteous? Because that will do it. That the more you see someone else and their inadequacy, the more it's actually making you feel more and more self-righteous. And it just grows in this cycle of just widening this divide and just kind of hardening our heart towards someone. Don't let it do that. And so you just ask the faith or the question, like if, if correction, if seeing error, Paul says, is really supposed to be about lovingly correcting so it's going to lead to genuine faith and repentance. It's about restoration and encouragement. Then we have to check what are the motives. And so uh, the question that I would ask is like, what is it right now in your life that you feel like would bring you great peace? The things that are bringing angst in your life, what change needs to happen so that you would experience peace? And you're like, don't, don't over-spiritualize it immediately. Like, think very practically in your life. What would bring you peace? Is it like, oh man, if people would just conform to what I think is behaviorally okay. If they just stop acting like that, things would be so much better. Or is it if people would just kind of agree with me? If, if their political allegiance would just align with mine or our political idea or person or whatever would prevail, then man, there'd be so much more peace. Or is it a, a widespread embrace of your particular conspiracy theory and we all have them? But what is it in your life, in your heart, that you feel like would bring you peace right now? And if it's anything other than others finding the gospel, the truth that has been entrusted to us, then we are remiss. Our hope for peace is not in some behavioral modification as the party of circumcision would come in and say, our hope is in changed hearts that are changed by the gospel. And so when we see the community around us, we have to know we are intentionally here, not just geographically, but the people in your life are the people that God has called you to invest in, to disciple them, to raise them up, to bring them to be followers of Jesus. And so do that well, church. And I love that so many of you already are. One of the most encouraging moments of my week, I won't call her out because she's sitting here, like really close to me, but in a home group this week, we're just sharing um, different prayer requests as we're wrapping things up. And, and one, of, one of the people in our home group um, asked us to pray for somebody by name who happened to be the hairstylist that they started having a conversation with and were able to invite to be part of Beloved Church. I just love that. That is what it looks like to be intentionally here, to see even the hairstylist that I just met 
Like, actually, God in his providence has brought me here so that I could help you to know this gospel that I've been entrusted with. That is what it looks like. And so let's be intentionally here and not see people just as a problem, but as an opportunity that they can be invited into the family of God. Verse 15, Paul kind of starts wrapping this part up. He says, to the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. What's he saying there? They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. And so works matter. But what are the works? They're just an outgrowth of what they know. If they know God, if there is a relationship there, if they know. So what saves, what brings about the change in works? It's simply knowing God. Knowing God is the gospel. It's this crazy irony that Paul's pointing out that those who trust in good works cannot actually do good works. Like the circumcision party, the people are saying, like, do these good works. They actually do no good works. C.S. Lewis um, once famously said, of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. Of all bad men, religious bad men are the absolute worst. The ones who think they know what is good and try to suppress the truth and just push that on others. That is terrible. The gospel is that God has saved us. And he's invited us into a relationship with him because of the price that was paid by Jesus on the cross. And so all who believe in him will be saved. Turn from your sin, trust in him to be your salvation. This is the good news. This is the gospel. This is what brings about salvation and then results in good works. But it's all about just simply knowing God. So know him. And and that creates a tension for us because um, Epimenides, you know, he, he says, all Cretans are liars evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Um, There's a problem with that. Have you caught it? Epimenides is a Cretan. And this became known as the Epidemen... Excuse me. It's a mouthful. Epimenides paradox. I can't even say it. It's a paradox that I can't even say. Do you see the paradox in it, though? That this philosopher is a Cretan. And so as a Cretan, to say all Cretans are liars. Wait, What? He is, what he is saying is always a liar. So is it not true that all Cretans are liars? If it's not true that all Cretans are liars, then that means he's actually, all Cretans are honest. And that means, wait, now he's saying an honest statement that all Cretans are liars. So it just keeps going and going. So how do we know what is true? (laughs) Even in a self-explanation or self-revelation, just How do we know what is actually true? How can we know truth? And this is such an important deal in our culture, our postmodern mindset. Like, what is actually truth? How can we know what is truth? That this Cretan can't make this statement because it becomes a paradox. That all Cretans are liars because it just becomes this endless cycle. It's true, it's not true, it's true, it's not true. How, How do we know what is actually true? And this is what we must see. We've been entrusted with truth. God defines truth. God has given us what is true. The gospel is true. It is good news. Truth comes from God. And so we must guard what has been entrusted. The gospel must be guarded. And Paul is saying, silence the people who want to come come in contrary to the gospel. Silence them. And it's kind of like having a remote. Because to protect the church, we have got to silence. We have got to silence the lies. And we've got to amplify. We've got to amplify the truth. You've got to turn up the volume on what is true. Turn it up as loud as possible. And you need to press the mute button on what is not true. Silence the lies. Don't listen to the bad teaching. Encourage the good teaching. The best way to protect the gospel is to see what is gospel. It's good news, right? What's the best way to protect news? You ever thought about that? Like in a world where we live, like there's so many different news outlets and they're saying competing things. And you're like, what is actually true? What would be the best way for us to know what is true and have that be like solid? Like it's not going to go away. It's to share it, right? The best way to protect news is to share that news. The best way to protect the gospel is to share it, to encourage good teaching, to know where it is. What is the gospel? 
Be strong in it. Be fluent in it, church. Know what it is. So when others creep in and they knock on your door and they start preaching a different gospel, you know, no, 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 no. That is not the good news. Silence that and amplify the truth. But let's also, as we wrap this up, let's note where these threats were coming from. It was within the churches in Crete. Often there are threats within the church. And, and, and by that, we easily start thinking like, oh, there could be other people in our church that are teaching false teachings and stuff like that. Um, but it's not just that. It's also in me and in you. But there are these voices that are lies that start to make us think like, hey, you'll never live up to it. You can't be enough. You're inadequate. Or just so many things start to creep in and we start to believe them. We fall into thinking our performance is what merits our standing before God. Oh, like the circumcision, maybe my works matter. Maybe I should do more. And that's not true. Your standing before God is entirely based on grace. That God alone saves. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so we just turn from our sin and believe, confessing him to be our Lord, to be our salvation. And he has saved. And then out of that, we grow in these good works. So silence the lies and amplify the truth. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your great love, the way in which you have revealed your truth, and that Jesus, you are truth. You are life. You are the way. So we come to you asking forgiveness of our sins um, as we've celebrated communion together. God, proclaiming your death until you come again, and knowing that in this time between, that you have called us to silence lies, to amplify truth, to share your gospel, what you have entrusted us with. So let us do so faithfully. God, we pray that you would reign gloriously as you are in our lives and over this city. And as we go out today and we cover the city in prayer, Father, we ask that you would hear and we speak confidently knowing that you do hear us because of the blood of Jesus that covers us. Father, we love you. We trust you. And we commit all of this to you and your glory forever. Amen.